Hello, everyone. This week, we're going to be continuing our discussion on the diversity of living things by looking at fungi and uh, plants. So first, let's look at fungi. Here are the learning objectives for the week. And this is where we are in our exploration of living organisms. So we've talked about archaeobacteria and bacteria. We've talked about protists. Now we're going to be looking at fungi and plants and then ultimately animals. So structure and function of fungi. They are all eukaryotes, which is why they have a membrane bound nucleus. They have cell walls. So remember plants will have cell walls, animal cells do not, fungi cells have cell walls. Their cell walls are made of chitin. They do not have chloroplasts, and I put that here because many people think that mushrooms, in particular, the classic mushroom, looks a lot like a plant. And so they expect them to be very closely related to plants, which they are not. They do not have chloroplasts, they do not photosynthesize, they do not photosynthesize. They are heterotrophic. They feed on other things. Some of them are single celled, such as a yeast, but most of them are multicellular organisms. For reproduction, we get some mushrooms are asexual, reproduce asexually, some are not just mushrooms, but fungi, some reproduce sexually, and some are able to do both. And in fact, we refer to fungi that can reproduce both asexually and sexually as being perfect fungi. And imperfect fungi can only reproduce asexually. If they're reproducing asexually, they are doing so through fragmentation or budding or release of spores. And here you can see that in action, where you may have come across these particular mushrooms in the woods, and when you pick them up, this is what they do. Or if you step on them, you see this explosion of spores. And then those spores can germinate where they land. And they reproduce by um, mitosis, giving rise to more cells that are exactly like the, the original spores. Although some fungi can reproduce sexually, they have cells that can fuse together, the nuclei fuse, meiosis occurs, and then we get gamete spores, where uh, here these would be uh, fully diploid spores, but the gamete spores uh, would be ones that would then have to fuse with other, uh, other spores in order to reproduce sexually. So classification, we're going to look at five different phyla of the kingdom, the, the fungus kingdom. But I put this diagram up here just to remind you again how closely fungi are related to animals. They are not related or they're not, they're distantly related to plants. They are more closely related to animals. So you see here where they share the common ancestor and then the animal kingdom branched off from there. And then we end up with five different groups of fungi that I will show you in just a moment. So here are the five phyla in the kingdom fungus, fungi. Um, we have the chytrids, the chytridiomycota, or often we may hear, notice that they are all mycota, that refers to the fungus. Um, but we often refer to them as mycetes. So the chytrids are often referred to as chytridiomycetes. And we'll talk about chytrids in a bit because of their uh, demise, their cause, much of the cause of the demise of the amphibian populations worldwide. Then we have the, the zygomycetes or the zygomycota. These are conjugated uh, bread molds. And what that means is that these are a group of fungi that reproduce sexually by fusing together of their um, vegetative state of, of the fungus. So these are our bread molds. Uh, ascomycetes, or the ascomycata, they are considered sac fungi. And we'll talk about these in a bit in relation to how they have impacted bat populations. 
Basidia mycetes or Basidia micata, these are the club fungi, the typical mushrooms that you think of are part of Basidia mycetes. And then the Glomero micata or Glomero mycetes, these include the mycorrhizae, which are extremely important to the plant kingdom. So much of our fungi are symbiotic, and I'll show you what, you know, some examples of that. And the others are mostly decomposers. So they are all heterotrophic in that they feed on something else um, or they're symbiotic. So they're heterotrophic in the form of being decomposers. So here are some symbiotic relationships, mutualistic relationships with plants where the mycorrhizae, and then this was in that the phylum that I mentioned a few moments ago, the glomerulomycata, include the mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae is a type of fungus that has a mutualistic relationship with a plant. Some of the mycorrhizae are ectomycorrhizae and some of them are endomycorrhizae. And what that refers to is they either live on the outside of the plant or inside, they penetrate into the roots of the plant. Now there is, is a mutualistic relationship, it benefits both organisms, it benefits the fungus and it benefits the plant. It benefits the fungus because the fungus gets nutrients from the plant. The plant is photosynthetic, produces sugars, and then the fungus can obtain those sugars from the plant. But the plant also benefits because mycorrhizae grow all over, and as I said, some penetrate into the roots of plants, which increases the surface area of the plant root system. And so it helps tremendously of increasing the surface area, which allows the plant to absorb more water and nutrients from the soils. 90% of all vascular plants have a mutualistic relationship with mycorrhizae. So it's extremely beneficial for the plants. Now there are other types of uh, fungi that have a relationship with plants that are not mycorrhizae. These are considered endophytic fungi. Endo meaning they live inside the plant. We don't know a lot about endophytic fungi. This is kind of a new field being studied, but it has been found, currently it has been known and is being, being explored, that these fungi release toxins that allow, that provide a protection to the plant. So the, the fungi release the toxins that deter herbivores from feeding on the plant. Here's an example of what mycorrhizae can do for a plant. So you can see the root structure here of the same type of plant, this oil palm plant, the root structure without mycorrhizae versus the root structure with mycorrhizae. So much larger root system, which allows for a healthier, more robust plant. Same idea here where you see a plant grown without mycorrhizae versus a plant grown with mycorrhizae. It allows for a much more efficient uptake of water and nutrients from the soil. Now lichen is another mutualistic relationship between fungus and algae species that you may be familiar with. You've probably seen lichen when you've been out and about in the woods. It comes in a lot of different forms and a lot of people confuse it with moss, but this is lichen, a more of a crusty form of lichen. This is a branching form of lichen and this is more leaf-like. And it's probably this one on the right that you see most often when you're out and about, either growing on the barks of trees or on the surface of rocks. It's a mutualistic relationship between the fungus. The fungus is the body of the organism. So the shape is all the fungus. And then it's with, with algae. And so the green tint that you see in all of these, that is the algae that's living with the fungus. And so it's mutualistic because it provides the fungus, much like the mycorrhizae with the plant, it provides the fungus with a food source. The algae is photosynthetic, makes sugars, and then the fungus can live off those sugars. But it also helps algae because these are environments where you wouldn't normally find algae living. Algae typically needs to be in the ocean or in rivers and streams and lakes, ponds, it needs to be in water. So the, the body of the fungus provides very small moist habitats where the algae can survive. So the algae gets habitat, the fungus gets food. 
mutualistic, they are both benefited from that relationship. Now, of course, there are pathogenic fungi, there are parasitic fungi. So we have mycotoxicosis. That means that we are being poisoned by ingesting, I have contaminated foods, but it's contaminated foods with a fungus. Remember, myco is always referring to a fungus. So this is toxic condition caused by ingestion of a fungus. Whenever we have some type of fungal infection, whether we've breathed it in or we've eaten it, ingested it, and it's gotten inside of our systems, it's quite difficult to treat because fungi and the human hosts are all, all have eukaryotic cells. And this is true with uh, protists as well. They are more difficult to treat than bacterial infections. And so a lot of our uh, medicines that, are, that we've designed to treat a fungal infection has many side effects because at the same time as going after the pathogenic invader, we also tend to cause damage to our own cells. So there's usually a lot of side effects when we have a fungal infection that we are treating. Now some fungi uh, infect the surface of our skin. These are called superficial mycoses. This would be like athlete's foot. That is a, um, a skin infection caused by a fungus or a ringworm is a skin infection caused by a fungus. Systemic mycoses, that's where we have inhaled or ingested the fungus. And that's where I was just talking about up here where it's difficult to treat. And we, we do it, we can treat it, but it often has many side effects, the, the medicines do. And then opportunistic mycoses, these are fungi that are present all the time in nature. They're inside of our bodies all the time. We do fine with them unless something happens that allows that particular uh, fungus population to grow. The example I have here is candida. Candida is a fungus, it's in our bodies all the time, but oftentimes after we have done some uh, rounds of antibiotics and we've killed off bacteria in our guts, then it can give candida the opportunity to grow. Now we're going to look at specific examples of fungal infections of plants and animals. So here are two examples where a fungal infection has essentially caused the, not, not really extinction because we do still have these types of trees, but a dramatic reduction in the populations of these trees. On the left, I have the chestnut blight. Chestnut blight was, both of these situations occurred early 1900s, and the chestnut blight was brought to the United States, introduced into the Bronx Zoo. It's transmitted from tree to tree by insects, same with the Dutch Elms disease on the right, that's transmitted by insects. And uh, the, the chestnut blight, it essentially has wiped out every American chestnut in the United States but it, um, it attacks the shoot of the plant. So it doesn't kill the root system. So it doesn't actually kill the plant, but it uh, prevents it from reproducing. So we still have some American chestnuts, but they are not reproductive. They do not produce chestnuts. And so they are essentially extinct. And there's a lot of research now about trying to um, produce hybrids of the American chestnut and the Japanese chestnut and other varieties that seem to be resistant to the blight. With Dutch Elms disease, I have this picture of Central Park in New York City because of these long lane, uh, a long uh, alley here of American elm trees. These are a nice mature stand of American elms because the American elms in Central Park were isolated from Dutch Elms disease as it moved through the East Coast of the United States. It was isolated by the city around it because again, it's transmitted by insects and the insects didn't make it to Central Park. So these trees survived and there are some other um, mature stands of American elm trees that have survived, but for the most part, it dramatically decreased the population of American elms in, in North America. So, oh, and then let's look at animals. So some of the 
problematic fungal infections of animals. You can see here the uh, chytrid fungus, and that has caused a big problem with amphibian populations. The image I have here on the left is all of the frogs that have gone extinct, and or at least a sampling of the frogs that have gone extinct just in the last 40 or 50 years. More of them have gone extinct than shown here, some close to 200. Uh, amphibian species have gone extinct, many of them because of this fungal infection. The fungus attacks the skin of frogs, and frogs rely on cutaneous respiration to breathe. They breathe across the surface of their skin as well as into their lungs. So they supplement their, their breathing because they have very primitive lungs, and so they supplement that gas exchange across the surface of their moist skin. Well, when the fungus infects the skin, that inhibits the, the uh, cutaneous respiration. So usually what happens is these frog populations or other amphibian populations are vulnerable. Their populations are declining uh, because of habitat destruction or maybe water pollution and other types of pollution on land. Um, and then because they're vulnerable and then this fungus moves in and it wipes out the populations. And then on the right, you see I have an example here of white nose fungus or white nose syndrome for the bat population. And we're going to look at this in, um, in more detail in lecture this week. But the white nose syndrome is a fungal infection. You can see it infects around the face. It infects the bats on their wings. And it occurs while they're in hibernation. And what the belief is, is that it wakes the bats. They become agitated and they wake up and they wake up too early. So they're, they're waking up during the winter months and then they, it's causing them to consume too much energy. They can't find food to support themselves. And so it weakens the individuals. And then overall, it's causing the demise of several different types of bat species in the United States. The link here is Fish and Wildlife Service that you can look at endangered species and you can see how many uh, bat populations are endangered and it's primarily due to the white nose syndrome. So I'm going to end here and then we'll pick up talking about plants next.